A Shot in the Dark by Silver Pup. Chapter 42 One could find many uses with ginger. It could serve as both food and medicine, and even as a spice if used correctly. He liked to use it best, sliced up, and boiled as a tea. He even used it to help his animals if they were ill, because magic was good and all, but nothing beat the simple and pure power of the earth. The only drawback to ginger was that he found it hard to grow. It grew best in warm climates, and his forest lacked that at times. He had to keep it in direct sunlight at all times if he wanted it to grow, and stuck up on it during the spring and summer if he wanted it to last through autumn and winter. Sebastian, one day we'll find a home in a warmer place. Then we can grow all sorts of plants, and we'll never have to worry about winter killing them, he told his friend as he patted the dirt around the seedling he had just planted. Sebastian just looked at him with his warm and understanding eyes. Animals were good at that. They understood things so much better than mortals ever did. That was why, when given a choice over whom to watch over, he had immediately chosen the earth and her children. Olorin, Kurunir, Marinatar, and Romestamo could fight over the mortals and their petty squabbles to their heart's content. He was happy with his mushrooms and rabbits. Speaking of Olorin, he glanced up as his fellow wizard finally appeared before him. The birds had told him hours ago that the tall and grey wizard who had entered the forest in a huff. He had wondered how long it would take Olorin to find him. He had never been very good at navigating through forests because he always had to stop and solve the riddles that the trees liked to whisper. He never did solve all of them. But now, hours later, Olorin, or Gandalf, as he went by here because he foolishly thought that having a secret identity would make him seem mysterious, finally stood before him. He had blood splattered across his robes. According to his nose, it wasn't from an animal or an orc or even a mortal. In fact, it smelled distinctly of Kuronir's blood. Hmm. Interesting. What do you want? He asked, because things like manners were only used by elves and Grunir. If it's about that stupid ring again, then I don't care. I told you already that you should have pushed that mortal into the volcano when he refused to destroy the ring. Saved you a lot of great fit order. Loring closed his eyes and took in a deep breath through his nose. I am not here because of the one ring. Did you finally snap and kill Grunir? Do you need help burying his body? He wondered idly, turning his attention back to his soil. Not that I can blame you. Sebastian, I have never liked him. Smells rotten, he does. And he likes to see my mushrooms when he thinks I'm not looking. Loren made a choking sound that made Sebastian half an amusement. I didn't come here for any of that either. He nodded and began to dig another hole for the next seed. Then what did you come for? I came to ask for a favor, Loren said quietly. And there was a hitch to his voice that he had not heard in centuries. Rather gust, my old friend. I need your help. The dwarves turned out to be rather efficient in packing up camps in record time. Before he knew it, the camp was broken down until nothing was left, and they were leaving Mordor behind. Bilbo found himself stuffed between a fussing oin, who would not release his elbow, and a silent dwellin who was doing his best impression of Thorin's brooding phase. I can walk by myself, oin, he complained to the healer for the sixth time in ten minutes. You can let go of me any time now. I know you can walk, the dwarf reassured, never losing his grip. I'm holding on to you in case you try to run off on some crazy and solo matter mission. Again! He scuffed and waved his free hand at their surroundings. Where do you expect me to go? Back to Mordor? You did it once already. I wouldn't put it past you to try it a second time, the healer replied, giving him a side-eyed glare. There would be no point. I don't have the ring anymore. Where did you find that blasted piece of evil anyways? Oin wondered, raising one bushy brow. Did you have it before you joined us, or did you acquire it later? Later, he replied, shaking his head. Remember the Misty Mountains? I found it in the tunnels there. At his side, Rollins suddenly made a noise in his throat that sounded like a strangled cuff. It was the first hint of acknowledgement he had gotten from the dwarf all day. What did you say? The warrior asked, stopping and grabbing his shoulder and turning the hobbit to face him. You found it where? In the Misty Mountains, he repeated, blinking in confusion before his brain finally caught up with the conversation. Oh, it was in the caverns we found. Remember when you were knocked out and I told you it was by a falling rock? Yeah, I lied. Gollum had done it, and so I confronted him and took the ring then. Dwellin looked like he had just watched Thorin die all over again. What? What's wrong? Why are you so upset? Oin asked, to squint to get him. 
You are under my protection when you found it. Nualan said, ignoring the healer as he continued to stare at Bilbo. I should have been more aware and kept it from you. Oh, Mahala, it failed you. The hobbit scoffed and rolled his eyes. You could hardly protect me from something you had no knowledge of. Besides, I have memories of the future, remember? I would have found it one way or another. Dwalin did not look at all reassured by his words. But before he could descend into a puddle of gloom and guilt, Oin reached over Bilbo's head and smacked the warrior on the side of his head. Okie dolf, he ordered, glaring at his cousin. We are not playing this game of who can wallow in his own self-pity and guilt the most. It's bad enough that I have to put up with our regular and can't compete for the title. I don't need you joining that competition. I think we can all safely say that Thorne is still the undisputed king of that, Bobo commented. Dwalin scowled and rubbed his head. I'm not breathing. Don't make me get Dwalin, the older dwarf threatened. Dwalin immediately closed his mouth. There's really no point in dwelling on it. Bilbo consoled, patting his friend on the arm. What's done is done. Let's just move on now, okay? The warrior did not look as if he was going to let it go anytime soon, but he did release the hobbit and rejoined the others in their march. Bilbo shared a look with Oin before following after their stubborn friend. Bilbo tried his best to keep up with the dwarves as they marched through the desolate land out of Mordor. After a good amount of time, he noticed that they were being trailed by Thranduil's army of elves, and beyond them, the armies of men. When Orin noticed his stares, he began to explain how they managed to create an army in so little time. We each used a portion of our reward from the expedition to hire them in, the healer said, ignoring his look of shock with the practiced ease that came with being an older sibling. Gloin was able to manage it so we didn't end up emptying Erebor's treasury with their demands. We also used Gandalf to intimidate them into moving as quickly as possible. That was fun to watch. The old wizard can be scary when they want to be. What about Thranduil? Did you pay him too? No, answered Dwalin, joining the conversation. Enjoying this without request and a reward. I think your elf had something to do with it. When we found Tara in the bear, he was beast. Never saw an elf get so mad in my life. I never thought that statue could even feel anger, Oin admitted, scratching at his beard. Good thing he's almost there to calm him down. He sighed and nodded. I believe that. Thranduil may hate outsiders, but he also fiercely loves his people. Seeing Tariel, an elf that he is supposed to protect, badly injured, must have been infuriating. Aye, he's a slimy old steak, but he does seem to keep his people in mind, Dwalin granted, sniffing. He must be very angry at me for driving her along, he mused, rubbing his forehead with two fingers. I don't know how I'm going to face him after all of this. You don't have to see him if you don't want to, Oin reassured, patting his arm. You don't have to see anyone you don't like. I like Thranduil just fine. It is his unpredictable nature that I don't care for. Well, you don't have to worry about that either. You're not leaving our side for the next century, Dwalin muttered. Was that your subtle way of implying that you're going to keep me locked up in Erebor? He joked, raising his eyebrows. Oin and Dwalin snorted in unison. What about the direction seems subtle to you? They either commented. Bubu blinked. What? You're going back to Erebor with us when you're going to marry Thorin and stay where we can protect you. Oin half ordered, rolling his eyes. My only knows what other types of mischief you'll get into if left alone. Ah, uh, three. We really can't leave you alone. When you are, you go and get yourself abducted and soul bonded to ancient evils. Dwalin added, nodding thoughtfully. Bubu didn't know what to say to that. He felt torn between irritation and their lack of trust in his ability to stay alive and a deep fondness that they cared so much for him. Finally, he decided to go with fondness because he really had put them all through enough with his adventure to Mordor. I still need to return to the Shire so my relatives know I'm not dead, he commented. I also have to take care of my house and possessions. We'll all be coming with you, Oin reassured without pause. Once this arrives, we can leave Erebor in her hands for the time being. Then we'll take you back to your Shire to get your china and mother's toilets. Thorin also needs to get the permission to marry you, Dwalin pointed out. If he doesn't, I'm pretty sure Aunt Ardenis will rise from the grave to strangle him. He raised his eyebrows at that. Aunt Ardenis? Thorin's mother, Oin explained. Oh, that's right, I remember now. He told me about her when we found her rooms. Well, at least you'll remember that much, muttered Dwalin. In response, Bilbo punched him in the shoulder. Bilbo was able to walk on his own until noon finally rolled around. By that time, his headache had returned, and breathing had grown to be rather difficult. 
When Oin noticed he was slowing it down, he barked something to Dwalin in Kuzdol that had the younger dwarf nodding. Then, before he realized it, he found himself swept up into Dwalin's massive arms as if he was nothing more than a child. Dwalin! He squeaked in surprise, grabbing onto the dwarf's shoulder on instinct. What are you doing? Put me down! No can't do it. He lose orders. The warrior replied, smirking. Da -da -da. I am, but I'm not a child. I must be heavy. Put me down before you strain yourself. The dwarf scoffed. Are you kidding? Really? Wade more is a dwarfling than you do right now. You can't work any further, Bilbo. Oin pointed out, cutting into the argument. You don't have the strength for it, so shut up and let one carry you. He scowled at the either, but didn't bother with him at the word. They were both correct. After all, he, even though he didn't want to admit it, you smell terrible, like spit and blood and ash. You don't smell any better. Dwalin retorted, wrinkling his nose. When was the last time you have been washed? When you were an airborne. Don't be stupid. It was before I was captured by the wraiths, he replied, and proceeded to ignore the scowl that appeared on Dwalin's face. They didn't seem to care how I smelled, only that I lived long enough for them to dump on their master. When we get back to airborne, I'm burning your clothes and throwing you into the nearest body of water. The warrior bowed, wrinkling his nose again. In response, Mumbo punched him in the shoulder again. When they finally stopped for the night, Boo found himself being shoved into Dory's arms without a word from Dwalin. Then, before he could complain that he was not an item or a pet, the warrior stuck off while his brother took his place before him. Good evening, Bilbo. Fallen greeted casually, as if they had just seen one another yesterday instead of months ago. How are you feeling? Fine, I feel fine, he replied as he eyed up the huge dwarf holding him. Hello, Dory. Nice to see you're doing well. Dory scowled down at him. It was not as threatening as Thorin's scowl, but it held a certain level of disappointment to it that reminded him of his mother, and that made it much worse. I don't know if I want to punch you or hug you, the weaver admitted as he set the hobbit down on his feet. If you weren't already injured, it would probably be the first. Bilbo carefully took a step back and tried to inch behind Balin without being too obvious. Please don't. One hit from Ori was enough for me. Thanks. I don't think Ori would appreciate you making his job more difficult. Balin pointed out reasonably, even as he pushed Bobo forward and away from his hiding spot. For all his friendly and innocent demeanors, Balin could be as mean as his baby brother. Bobo was beginning to suspect that Balin was the one the Wallen learned all his glares from. Ori snorted and dropped his pack on the ground. He can handle it. If I could manage a sick and whiny Nori and Ori at the same time, he can handle one hobbit. If it helps, I am sorry I had to leave you all behind like that. It's not how I envisioned our goodbyes. Bilbo confessed, biting his lower lip as he studied the weaver. Dory raised a single silver brow as he kneeled it down and began to rummage through his pack. Oh, really? Then does that mean you promise not to do it again? He bit his lip even harder. I don't know if I can. The weaver said nothing as he pulled out a small leather bag. When he finally did look up, his face was set in a stony expression. That's not good enough. Promise me, or I will end our friendship here and now. Balin cast. Dory! No, don't argue with me, Balin. The dwarf ordered, never moving his green eyes away from the hobbit. It is hard enough for me to live with someone like Nori as my brother. I am constantly worrying that he's dead or in jail or in some sort of danger of his own making. I will not add to that worry with you, Bilbo. Bilbo sighed and nodded. I understand. My actions have been selfish, even if that wasn't what I intended. I don't regret saving you all, and I never will. But I'm sorry I ended up hurting you and the others. I never wanted that to happen. And so part of me didn't want to get close to you all to begin with. Does that mean you will start thinking of yourself from now on? Dory questioned, his expression never wavering, that you won't throw yourself into danger carelessly. I'll do my best to break this habit, he promised, nodding his head. It will take me some time, though. I cannot change overnight. I don't expect you to, Dwalin reassured as his expression relaxed into a kinder and warmer look. It is enough that you're willing to try. Now get over here and let me braid your hair. He blinked. What? You heard me. I'm going to fix your hair. It's been driving me crazy since we found you. The weaver explained, gesturing for him to sit down in front of him. He looked to Balin for help and only got a shrug for his troubles. You might want to do as he says. Your hair is rather messy. No help. 
no help at all, he muttered, giving the old dwarf a glare as he marched over to flip down in front of Dory. Once he did, he felt the dwarf begin to untie the few braids that had withstood his time on the road and imprisonment. Malin grinned as he took a seat across from him and pulled at his pipe from his robes. I've learned how to pick my battles with Dory. This is one I know I will never win. Why? The hobbit wondered, wincing slightly as his hair was tugged too harshly. Behind him, Dory snorted and relaxed his grip. Because he knows not to get in between me and my brothers when I'm scolding them. It took him a moment to make sense of Dory's words. When he finally did, he sniffed and muttered something about Ash getting in his eyes and rubbed at them discreetly with his wrist. Dory and Balin said nothing, but that was fine. They had both said enough already.